Good afternoon. Thank you for joining us. We're just going to give it a little bit here for uh, everyone to get into the room before we get started. All right, hello everybody and welcome to the Invasive Species Center webinar series. My name is Kendra Jolly and I am the Partnership and Grants Coordinator here at the Invasive Species Center and I will be your moderator for today. Before we begin, I would like to acknowledge that the Invasive Species Center honors the long history of the First Nations, Inuit and Métis Northern Nation peoples on the lands now known as Canada, and strives to show respect to their ancestors, their communities, and to them individually. We greatly appreciate the significance of the lands, waters, and all living things, and offer our gratitude to the Indigenous peoples for their care and for care for and teachings about our earth. Our relationship with Indigenous communities are important, and we will continue to listen and learn how we can be in a good relationship with the Indigenous peoples, the land and waters, and all living things, and act accordingly. The Invasive Species Center respectfully acknowledges that our head office is located on the traditional lands of the Anishinaabek, the Batchewana and Garden River First Nations, as well as the longtime settlement of the Métis people in the Robinson Huron Treaty area. The Invasive Species Center is a not-for-profit organization that connects stakeholders, knowledge, and technology to prevent the introduction and spread of invasive species that harm Canada's environment, economy, and society. We've got lots of great invasive species resources on our website, including species profiles, best management practices, and more. So you can always check us out at www.invasivespeciescenter.ca. You are also invited to sign up on our homepage for our newsletter, bi-weekly media scan, and event invitations, which is where you can hear about some great upcoming webinars. We also have a great invasive species training program. It's going to offer virtual courses on topics that are related to the invasive species. This program offers virtual self-paced courses for anybody who wants to learn more about the impacts of invasive species in their community or workplace. Currently, we have three programs available with new courses in development. You're able to sign up to receive updates on any future courses. And if you have any questions, you're again invited to visit our website check out our FAQ page, and you can also email us at training at invasivespeciescenter.ca. Now, before we get started today, just a couple of things we do wanna go over. There will be time for questions at the end of the presentation today. If you do have a question at any time, please type it into the Q&A box or the question box, and I'll read it to our presenter after the webinar. If you're having any technical difficulties at any time, please type them into the chat box or respond to the email found in your registration, and we will do the best we can to resolve them for you. We've also enabled closed captioning today, so if you'd like to follow along using the closed captioning, you can turn that on with the closed captioning button on your taskbar. Lastly, we will have a very brief survey following today's webinar. If you could take some time to fill it out for us, we would very much appreciate it. Uh, today's webinar is titled, Using Plants to Control Common Buckthorn, and I am pleased to introduce our speaker, Mike Schuster. Uh, he is a researcher in the Department of, excuse me, sorry. Excuse me, research in the Department of Forest Resources at the University of Minnesota, member of the Minnesota Invasive Terrestrial Plants and Pest Center. Uh, his research does focus on the process of exotic plant invasions and their consequences for ecosystem functioning. Since 2016, Mike and his collaborators have led the Covered Up Project, which evaluates novel revegetation approaches to forest understories intended to increase biotic resistance and reduce invasion of buckthorn and other exotic woody species. And with that, I will hand things over to Mike. Thanks and uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, excited to see the the uh, number of people in the in the uh, participant list. That's awesome. So let me get my screen shared here. Oop. I'm assuming everything is great. 
Otherwise, you're going to tell me. <laughs> so yeah, um, I'm Mike Schuster. I work at the University of Minnesota um, in the Department of Forest Resources, and we have this project called Cover It Up that that looks at using native plant species to help control buckthorn and also some other uh, invasive species as well. Um, but before we get uh, too far into it, I do want to make sure I recognize that this is a collaborative effort. It's not just me. Um, for the past seven years or so, Peter Rague, uh, the, the gentleman in white here, has been my research partner. Uh, we've been coordinating uh, this project together uh, under the uh, guidance of Peter Reich, who's our lab head. And then, of course, the people that are you know really doing the work are the uh, dozens of interns and technicians that we work with and um, all of them are our heroes in their own way um, so I uh, just want to make sure I, I take my hat off uh, to them uh, before we get into it so in short, what we've been able to show is that establishing native species quickly after initial buckthorn management can reduce the amount of buckthorn returning over multiple years. Um, and so the, the quickly is really the, the key part there. And uh, I'll show you evidence to support that. Um, we found that seeding grasses and wildflowers in sites with ample light uh, can slow or in some cases prevent the growth of new and existing buckthorn. And we've also shown that planting shrubs and trees that keep their leaves late into the fall or are evergreen uh, can consistently suppress or even eliminate buckthorn invasion. Um, if this is of interest to you, which presumably it is, uh, you can certainly check out our website. We have a, a project website called coveredup.umn.edu. Uh, you know, wait till the end of the uh, end of the talk to do that. But uh, Please, we have uh, species lists there. We have seeding rates, everything that we, we do about this stuff that I'm going to present today and other related experiments on that website. So uh, please check it out. All right. So if you are watching this, you probably have uh, some interest in buckthorn, right? Uh, and you may be familiar with uh, the diversity of ways that we currently manage buckthorn. There's many of them, right? There's lots of different ways that we have to remove buckthorn, ranging from mechanical removal, uh, you know, hand cutting, hand pulling, uh, to forestry mowers like uh, this figure over here. Um, we have options like goats, which really are just another version of mechanical removal. Uh, we have herbicides. Um, and even in some cases, like in grasslands, we can burn buckthorn out. So lots of different ways that we can, you know, physically remove buckthorn. Uh, but the problem is that regardless of which of those methods we use, they are almost always incomplete. Um, we have continued pressure from re-sprouts from damaged stems. So that's what this picture is over here is this is a, a stem that's been mangled by a forestry mower uh, and it's shooting, sending out new shoots all around. That's, uh, you know, continued buckthorn presence even though the main stem has been removed. Uh, we have small buckthorn that escape treatment, you know, whether we're talking about, you know, little fellas like this or even larger, a lot of stems go untreated either by, uh, you know, just being missed or intentionally being excluded from the management protocol. Um, we also have new buckthorn that come into the site, whether that's from seed banks or continued dispersal from nearby trees or birds um, that create kind of these chia pets, these carpets of uh, small new buckthorn uh, immediately after initial management. And so having all of these different sources of ongoing uh, buckthorn pressure means that most stands, most forest understories that we treat for buckthorn require repeat treatment within a few years. Um, this is one of our research sites um, in Marine on St. Croix, Minnesota. And this was an area that was forest remote and in this particular context left without any further intervention. And you can see within two years here, um, the amount of regrowth that we have. All this green is, is buckthorn. Um, and most of that is re-sprouts, you know, those, those new stems sprouting from uh, the, their damaged predecessors. And those re-sprouts represent a significant challenge, right? If we leave them unchecked, if we leave them as they are, they will qu 
quickly reclaim dominance of practically any understory community. Uh, for example, this is another site where forestry mowers went through. Um, and the year after I was scouting that site um, and found this uh, re-sprout here. Now, I'm, I'm not a small person. I'm uh, six foot two, uh, which is about 1.8 meters tall. And this re-sprout was as big as me. Um, now it was growing off of a stem that was, you know, a particularly large buckthorn in its previous life. Um, so it had lots of resources to regrow, but still like 1.8 meters of regrowth in a single year is outstound, uh, you know, what outstanding is <laughs> astonishing. Um, and so that's a lot of bio biological potential to reclaim dominance. It's a big hurdle. Um, and so these re-sprouts need to be dealt with in some way. You need to control them. Um, and there are multiple ways you can do that. One way that you can and has been effective for us is using herbicides. And you have a diversity of routes that you can go with that. You can you know, do cut and treat where you, you know, physically cut the stem and paint on the herbicide. You can do basal bark applications where you're spraying the, the herbicide on, onto the bark, or you can do foliar herbicide where you're spraying herbicide onto the leaves. And most of our work has focused on that foliar application. Um, we primarily use foliar application of a herbicide called phosamine ammonium, or it's sold under the name crenite, um, which is actually a fairly uncommon herbicide to use. Uh, it's very poorly understood in the scientific literature. It's all you know trade secrets and, and stuff like that, um, but it's a bud inhibitor. We know that's a bud inhibitor. It prevents buds from uh, sprouting the following season. So we go in, we spray, uh, we spray buckthorn in the late summer or early fall. This bud inhibitor gets soaked up through the leaves and uh, makes those buds the following spring stay dormant. And you can see what those uh, buds look like here. Uh, these are dark, dark buds that aren't going to be producing leaves. They're essentially dead. Um, and so that basically starves the plant of carbon, makes it so it can't photosynthesize. Um, and we found it to be highly effective in practice. Uh, almost all of our sites where we've used crenite, we've had really good uh, mortality or kill rates associated with using it. Now, you probably are wondering, well, if this is you know, a relatively uncommon herbicide, how does it compare to more of the mainline stuff? Um, and so we've looked at that. Uh, last year, we did a, a pretty simple comparison uh, between phosphine ammonium, crenite, and uh, triclopyr product. Triclopyr is a, another very common herbicide that's used. It's you know, more commonly used in the form that's referred to as garlon, um, but a new generation of, a new formulation of triclopyr is triclopyr choline, which is Vaslan. Um, and we did a, a comparison between crenite and Vaslan to see which was more effective. Um, and in this um, simple case study that we did, we found that both triclopyr and phosamine offered comparable control of buckthorn. Uh, and you can see that in this graph here. So this is the percent cover or like the, the spread of buckthorn on this uh, site compared to, uh, or with triclopyr and phosamine, both before and one year after treatment. So the blue is before and the orange is one year after treatment. And so we see you know pretty consistent reduction in, in buckthorn either way. Um, so it seems like they're comparable in that way, but they do differ in their non-target impacts. Uh, for example, phosamine also tends to inhibit or hurt grass species. In this particular case, we saw um, notable control of, um, of reed canary grass uh, in addition to buckthorn. So that's, that's actually kind of a perk, right? <laughs> reed canary grass being another common invasive species. Um, triclopyr tended to hit uh, native woody species a little bit harder. So things like box elder uh, were also notably controlled uh, by triclopyr, whereas crenite had less of an effect on, on other woody species. Um, also anecdotally, places where we've used triclopyr tend to be more variable. There's, seems like there's a little bit more, um, a little bit more art that goes into the application of triclopyr. Uh, it, uh, has had some some cases where it just did not work very well at all in comparison to crenite where we had like a really uh, consistent outcome. 
So if you're a manager and you're wondering what that means, um, uh, it means that if you're performing mechanical removal, you have to pair it with some sort of follow-up treatment, right? I'm talking about herbicides here. That's worked really well for us, particularly, particularly phosphamine ammonium has worked well for us. That bud inhibitor herbicide has worked well for us. Um, but regardless of how you do it, you need to, you, we need to pair uh, mechanical removal with some additional follow-up to deal with those re-sprouts because those re-sprouts are um, quite the challenge that, that uh, won't go away uh, unless we do some additional follow-up. And so I'm going to have a bunch of these manager takeaways throughout the, the talk. Hopefully those are like kind of like the big take-home messages that, that you uh, take home with you. Um, so uh, trying, to, trying to isolate those things out a little bit for you. Okay, so follow-up can do a good job of dealing with these resprouts, right? They're, they're a challenge, but we have ways to deal with them. What can be a little bit more um, pervasive, a little bit more continuous, a little bit more of a long-term problem are all those other sources of buckthorn that persist despite the initial removal, despite the follow-up. So those small buckthorn that escape treatment, maybe we don't treat them on purpose, maybe they just escape treatment or avoid treatment. Um, and those new buckthorn that come in from the seed bank or from dispersal, those things aren't gonna be captured as well by follow-up treatments like foliar herbicides. So what do we do with those, um, right? Because those things exist, because those new buckthorn exist, even with follow-up, removal is often only a short-term gain, right? Even with follow-up, buckthorn management has um, effects that disappear fairly quickly. Um, and that's because by removing buckthorn, we're actually increasing the amount of resources available in the forest understory, right? Consider this image here, right? We have an area where on the left, buckthorn has been left intact because of a property line. And on the right, we have an area where it's been removed because that's been the management area. And it doesn't take uh, much imagination to recognize that any new individual popping up on the left side of this image here is gonna experience a very different set of conditions than an individual popping up on the right. And so the thing about buckthorn is that we have these ongoing sources of buckthorn uh, propagation. And buckthorn tends to exclude native species from the systems it invades. So there aren't a lot of native species left to soak up these extra resources, but there is plenty of buckthorn there to do that. Um, and so buckthorn benefits quite strongly from the removal of um, other buckthorn. By removing those other buckthorn, we're actually priming systems for more invasion, for better performance of those new cohorts, those new generation of, of plants. And we characterized that in one of our early early studies, looking at survival of buckthorn relative to canopy openness or how much light makes it through the canopy. And so this graph here shows the three year survival rate of buckthorn grown under different canopy conditions, ranging from totally closed 0% open to about 20% openness. And what you'll see is that that three year survival rate um, really you know picks up between zero and 10% and then at above 10% kind of levels off. And by removing buckthorn, we're essentially moving from a place, you know, around 2% light availability where buckthorn actually has a really hard time taking off, new buckthorn has a hard time taking off, to something like this, like 20% light availability, where buckthorn loves it. It's going to grow, you know, just fine and uh, have a really high survival rate. And so by removing buckthorn, we actually set ourselves up for a bigger challenge. Right. And so this is kind of a textbook example of this thing called the Sisyphus effect, named after the uh, uh, Greek mythological character Sisyphus, who is you know kind of doomed to push a boulder up a hill uh, repeatedly for all eternity. Um, so in the context of invasion, um, you know, we can kind of conceptualize the process of buckthorn removal um, as pushing this boulder up this hill, right? Uh, that we're starting from a, you know, from a heavily invaded state and we're making progress by using things like uh, cutting, mechanical removal and herbicides. We can make progress and push our boulder up the hill and we can reduce invasion under this constant management input. Um, but the problem is that as soon as we let go, as soon as we step away, 
Um, there are all these other factors that push that boulder back down the hill that cause the rapid reestablishment of buckthorn. Uh, so, you know, that seed bank, those uh, dispersal events from, from nearby plants or from birds, and those remaining untreated stems all pull that boulder back down the hill. And maybe that ends us in a place where it's comparable to what it was before, or maybe it's even worse, right? Maybe we have more stems, maybe we have a higher stem density, more invasion impacts. Um, and so all these things lead to kind of this repeating cycle of management and then Remanagement and management, 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 right? Never ending, um, just like Sisyphus. But what if we can establish native plants to prevent forests from slipping back into a buckthorn dominated state? What if we can use native plants to hold that boulder up and stop it from rolling back down the hill? Um, this is called revegetation. Um, and it's commonly done in forests for other goals, um, not necessarily invasion management, but other things like just improving biodiversity, like providing uh, forage for, you know, different species, habitat, pollinators, that sort of thing, um, for providing, like I said, habitat for wildlife, for providing fuel for controlled burns, um, or for cultural or recreational aesthetic reasons. Um, these are all reasons why people, you know, introduce plants into forests, right? Um, and um, and those things are all true, but revegetation also increases competition, right? It also reduces the amount of available resources for buckthorn. And so if we're moving from, you know, a place about 20% light availability, maybe revegetation can push us back beyond this 10% threshold into the area where light availability starts to limit buckthorn performance. Um, and so you can see in this image here, this is the area where we've seeded uh, grass. This is a little bit of a spoiler alert, by the way. You can see here where we've seeded in some grasses on the left and on the right left it on, uh, uh, unseeded. And yeah, you can see that, again, this is a very much a different environment than the one on the right. Um, and so by revegetating, perhaps we can push these systems back into an area where buckthorn are suppressed and prevent that boulder from rolling back down the hill, right? What if those plants can prop that boulder up and kind of you know, keep that ecosystem in a state that is more functional and more diverse and prevent the resurgence of buckthorn? So one of the first things that we did was um, this early proof of concept test where uh, in 2017, we went into three different sites that were mostly oak dominated systems and uh, planted them with different types of treatments, right? Ranging in, in the species use to the approach and the, kind of the, the amount of management input that each required. And so we took just an unplanted control where we, we didn't do anything. We just, you know, took that initial management scenario where we've you know, gone through and, you know, done some uh, follow-up herbicide, but then otherwise left it. Um, we've also done it where we've uh, seeded in a mixture of grasses and wildflowers uh, or planted plugs of Pennsylvania sedge um, or planted bare roots of a uh, combination of sugar maple and bal balsam fir trees. Um, a little bit of an odd couple, but, you know, you'll see how it goes. <laughs> Um, and then we have a bare root uh, kind of shrub cocktail where we have two different elderberry species, American hazel and gray dogwood, as our treatments. And we watched those for several years to see how they performed and how buckthorn growing underneath them performed. And in order to provide kind of this apples to apples comparison or, or buckthorn to buckthorn comparison uh, across these different treatments, uh, we had to have kind of a a uniform set of measurements, right? And so we did this using um, kind of this integrative metric that we call cumulative buckthorn growth. And so this, this metric is intended to account for both buckthorn growth and survival in one metric. Uh, and so we started doing this by collecting buckthorn fruit um, in you know February, March. So it's been cold stratified, it's been out in the, the field, it's ready to go, um, collecting that off of the trees um, and cleaning them, extracting the seeds and putting these into our plots. So in 2017, when this experiment started, we had you know, a cohort of buckthorn that popped up from, from these seeds. Uh, and we followed those seeds for the next few years. And after those plants had you know died and others grew, we went and estimated the 
the mass, the size of these different plants based on their uh, height and the number of leaves they had, and took the proportion of that mass to the number of seedlings that first popped up. And that's the metric that we call cumulative buckthorn growth. Again, it accounts for the amount of buckthorn that survive and how big they are all at once. And what we found uh, that what we found is that after four growing seasons, four years, uh, all of these treatments reduce buckthorn performance in some way, right? Um, but particularly trees and shrubs had the strongest impact. Uh, shrubs reduced buckthorn invasion by 89% over four years, and trees had a comparable effect of 81% reduction. Um, we also saw that sedges reduced invasion by 66%, and then that seed mixture uh, reduced it by 51%. And we think a lot of the variation in performance here is due to uh, how much shade is produced, but particularly how much shade is produced by each treatment in the fall. Um, so the thing about buckthorn is that it tends to hold its leaves late into the fall. And this is one of the things that made it a desirable species when it was first introduced in the 19th century as a hedge plant. It holds its leaves late, so it means it's, it's doing the whole hedge thing really well for a longer period of time. But those same traits also mean that buckthorn is really a really an effective com competitor in natural systems, right? It's capturing light and competing against other species far later into the season than most other species. Um, and what we found was that it's this light that really controls buckthorn survival. Um, so these are, are kind of cartoon graphs, but um, we, we did a study where we looked at the probability of survival over light availability. And if we partitioned the amount of light in each season and saw how that affected the probability of any particular buckthorn living or dying, we found that buckthorn really didn't care how much light was available in the summer. They had kind of a constant survival probability regardless of how much light was available. But if we look at the fall, that's when buckthorn start to respond to light availability. If you have less light available in the fall, then buckthorn starts to peter out, right? If you have produce really dark conditions in the fall, then buckthorn is sensitive to that. And so if we can limit light availability in the fall, we can kind of turn one of buckthorn's strengths into a weakness, right? We can really, you know, we can hit it where it hurts, right? If we can take that fall light away from it, then suddenly buckthorn isn't as robust, isn't able to survive as well. And when we looked at how long each of the species in these treatments kept their leaves in the fall, we found that the elderberry species, red elderberry, common elderberry, had statistically indecipherable um, duration of, of, of leaves. So they held their leaves just as late in the fall as buckthorn did. Other species like gray dogwood, hazel, maple, all of them lost their leaves far earlier than buckthorn did. But those elderberry species like red elderberry that you can see here, they held their leaves just as long. And even though they weren't green, they weren't photosynthesizing, they were still shading the buckthorn. And that's the important part, right? We just have to have them shade. We don't have to have them photosynthesizing. They just have to shade the little buckthorn underneath. And that's what they did. And, and so trees and shrubs tended to soak up that fall light. And that's one of the reasons why they were so effective. Um, the elderberry in particular, was the dominant species in those shrub plots. Uh, red elderberry in particular just took off. And so it's highly productive and it has this extended leaf phenology, as we call it, that makes it a really good competitor to, against buckthorn. Um, and uh, for the tree plots, there was this, this really cool pairing of the maples and the firs. The maples, they grew really fast and they produced lots of leaves, but they lost their leaves really early. So you know, their amount of contribution is unclear, but the, the fur grew a little bit thicker and they stayed shorter and they're evergreen. So they shaded in the fall as well. So both the shrub plots and the tree plots offered this fall shading and really drove, um, really drove the reduction of buckthorn in those two treatments. But what about that herbaceous seed mix, right? Those things, you know, 
those things aren't aren't shrubs and aren't trees, but we still uh, were able to see invasion potential. Uh, again, that cumulative buckthorn growth metric cut in half just by seeding, and you know that's primarily grasses, um, and those grasses block some fall light because you know of standing thatch, right? Th those grasses that senesce stay standing and they still block some light. Um, and it's a lot easier to seed than it is to plant, right? Like, uh, I should have a picture here of us planting all these things that, you know, it's a lot of work, right? It's a lot easier to seed. And so we tested this, right? We, we, at the same time we were doing the small plot kind of intensive study, we did a more practical test where we took 29 pairs of 30 meter long plots uh, that were either seeded or unseeded across seven different sites ranging in canopy type. Um, our darkest site was 4% uh, canopy openness. Our lightest site was 19% canopy openness. And we seeded, we performed these seeding trials all across these different sites, all around Minnesota. Um, and that seed mix was dominated by wild rye grasses. So we had 11 different types of grasses, but it was especially um, kind of loaded with silky Virginia and Canada wild rye species. Uh, but it also had 22 wild flower species like white snake root, uh, brown and black at Susan, hyssop, bellflower, and then some sedges um, as well. Um, but the bulk of the mass really is, is in those wild rye species. And in this larger experiment, we were able to more cl closely track uh, the performance of buckthorn seedlings um, over time. And um, when we introduced new seeds each year, we found an accumulating impact of that, of that herbaceous seed mix over time. So this graph here shows, again, cumulative buckthorn growth um, over uh, different survey years. So these are the years that we're actually going out to the field and measuring stuff. Each of these different color bars corresponds to a year in which buckthorn uh, were planted or the seed was dispersed. So there's the 2018 cohort, the 2019, 20, and 21 cohorts. And then the open bars are in the unseeded plots and the closed bars are the seeded plots. And so for the 2018 cohort, that earliest cohort that we followed, uh, which are the green bars, we can see that by 2022, there's a 65% reduction, you know, going from about here to down here in cumulative buckthorn growth. And for the 2019 uh, cohort, which was actually in the ground for a shorter period of time, right, a whole year less, we had an even larger effect. We had a 77% reduction in cumulative buckthorn growth in that 2019 cohort. And so the largest impact that we've seen in these plots are be have been from those earlier dispersed seeds. And so seeding seems to have a much stronger impact on those buckthorn, buckthorn that show up very shortly after that initial management. So the takeaway here is that establishing native plants immediately after some initial removal can reduce invasion in the following years. Um, and uh, this means that as the amount of buckthorn is reduced, there's less need for follow-up. There's less need for additional management inputs. And the smaller those buckthorn get, the easier the job theoretically gets. <clears throat> oh, yeah. <laughs> we also got to um, do some stuff with fire, right? So we had these, these big areas of, of seeding. Turns out, if you if you get grass to grow, uh, you can burn it. So um, we we did some some small burn tests and found that yeah the seeded areas had better burn uh, performance as well. All right, hopefully that mute worked. <laughs> All right, so grass seeding can facilitate more effective management of remaining buckthorn. That's true for burning, uh, but it's also true for other types of management, right? Because the buckthorn are fewer and smaller, they're more vulnerable. So we can treat them with um, herbicide more effectively, but we could also burn them more effectively.
And so we've provided some good evidence that seeding can work, um, right? It makes the biggest difference for buckthorn that show up early and uh, it can be effective, right? But there's this one problem, right? If buckthorn is most effective for those early seedlings, what about all the ones that show up later, um, right? Can't buckthorn last in the soil for up to six years? That's kind of the conventional wisdom. Well, no, actually it can't. Um, so across all these different experiments, we followed more than 13,000 seeds. We've surveyed more than um, a kilometer of transects every year. And what we found is that almost every buckthorn seed that would germinate, that does germinate, does so in the first year. Um, so this is a, a series of pie charts that show uh, the proportion of germinants that show up in each year. Um, and so different colors correspond to different years. The main thing is that green is the first year. And that's all you see, right? It's green. So 97% of all germination happens in the first year after dispersal. Um, so you got about 3% that shows up in the second year, and then less than 0.1% shows up in the third year or later. So no, buckthorn doesn't last five or six years in the soil. It lasts one or two, really just one for the most part, right? So where do we get this idea that Buckthorn lasts five or six years, right? Where'd that come from? Well, it turns out that it's based on a game of telephone that um, about 20 years ago, there was a report made for the Met Council, which is um, a municipal agency here in the Twin Cities of Minnesota. And the author of that report was looking for information on Buckthorn. And what they found was this article from the Ottawa Citizen in the 90s that was talking about glossy Buckthorn, not common Buckthorn. And in that article, um, a manager says that in some places there's so much seed in the soil that stopping buckthorn could take five or six years. And the author misconstrued this statement to suggest that the seed bank lasted five or six years. Um, and that report was picked up by the US Forest Service. And after that basically became conventional wisdom. But you know, again, that's not what the data show. That's not what we see in nature. Uh, and so, Right. And so reestablishment of these sites is primarily driven not by these long lived seed banks, but by plants that are on site within two years of management. Right. There's not these big, you know, surprises. There's not going to be a party of buckthorn that just shows up in year five of your of your management plan. They're going to be there in the first year. You may not see them, but they're there. Um, Right. And so if we're designing management plans, we want to cast a wide net. We want to manage aggressively, particularly um, across a diversity of size classes. So manage those small buckthorn too. Don't let them bide their time and get stronger because the longer we wait to manage those small ones, the stronger they will be and the harder they will be to control. All right. So one last thing that I want to share with you um, is how site characteristics affect this story, right? How, how do, uh, you know, how does this work in your system, for example? Um, and one of the biggest things that differs across the different sites that we've looked at is canopy openness, how much light is getting through. Right. And so let's talk about how that canopy openness affects the performance of these different treatments. And so for our grass dominated seed mix, we found that it was most effective at generating native cover uh, in our brighter sites. So this is a graph uh, that shows grass cover um, relative to, um, to different years and treatments uh, across our different sites. So the sites uh, all have this number, this percentage, that's their canopy openness. And what you'll see is that for the sites on the right, seeding resulted in far more grass cover than for the sites on the left. Right? In fact, seeding was not very effective at all in those sites on the left, right? In those dark sites, uh, less than 10% light availability, seeding didn't generate that much grass cover. Um, but these ones on the right, uh, 17, 18, 20% light availability worked a lot better. And so this impacted the effect that seeding had on buckthorn too. Um, so this is looking at uh, one year seedling survival 
survival rate uh, over canopy openness for unseeded in, in gray and seeded plots in green. You'll see that at a 20% canopy openness, which looks something like this on the left, that had on average a 70% reduction in buckthorn survival. Whereas a canopy uh, openness like at 7%, which looks something like this, this you know relatively intact oak forest, oak canopy, that reduced buckthorn survival rate on average by a third. There's a lot of noise around that, but that's the, the signal, right? In comparison, uh, we saw that trees and shrubs completely excluded buckthorn in the majority of, of all the plots that we tested in that initial experiment, right? So we had 18 different uh, trial plots for those different uh, tree and shrub pla uh, plantings. And for the tree plots, for the tree plots, 11 out of 18 had no surviving buckthorn um, after four years. And in the shrub plots, 12 out of 18 had no surviving buckthorn. And so, you know, when we were talking about 81% reduction, 89% reduction, in a lot of cases, that was 100% reduction, but there were the minority of cases that drove that average down to be 89%, 81% instead. And so this graph here shows survival, uh, seedling survival of buckthorn, again, over canopy openness, and the tree and shrub, shrub uh, plots are these two bottom lines here. And the control, the un, you know, the unseeded, unplanted is this gray line. Right? And so you'll see that, yeah, there's virtually complete exclusion of buckthorn by trees and shrubs in the darkest sites, right? Looking down here, anything below 10%, we had virtually complete exclusion of buckthorn. And then there's just these sites in the lighter conditions that tended to let a few more buckthorn survive. And so we have the greatest impact of our seed mix in these highlight scenarios, you know, 20% or more canopy openness. That's where we see the, the largest reduction in buckthorn survival. Um, and we saw the greatest impact of trees and shrubs in the darkest sites, although they were generally effective, you know, everywhere. And so this kind of brings us full circle. Um, Right, so let's put it all together. We start off by showing that we need to do some sort of follow-up, right? We need to deal with those re-sprouts. And so follow-up removal of existing buckthorn is needed, um, even with revegetation. You know, we need to have some sort of herbicide or other approach to deal with those re-sprouts. And without those, buckthorn, you know, reclaim dominance very, very quickly. And so that buys us some time to deal with these other sources of buckthorn. Um, and we can deal with those uh, effectively by revegetating, right? We can revegetate uh, to slow the growth of those, those new and existing buckthorn and maybe even prevent some from showing up. But which way we do that, the method that we use is gonna depend on things like canopy openness. It's gonna vary by site. And so I'm so sorry if you can he hear this uh, behind me. It's really unfortunate timing. I'm gonna wait a second. Great. <laughs> um, all right, so our Elimus dominated seed mix, our, our wild rye dominated seed mix, best suppressed buckthorn in lighter sites, things that were more than 10% open, and our trees and shrub plantings worked well pretty much everywhere, but especially in those darkest sites, but they did require a lot more effort, right? We had to go in and plant those things instead of just spread seed. Um, and so ultimately this all comes together to suggest that revegetating forests after buckthorn initial management can lead to less buckthorn. It can reduce our need for additional uh, costs and additional investment. It can potentially improve biodiversity and ecosystem functioning and ultimately lead to enhanced value of natural areas for us and uh, you know, the greater world. So I wanna thank you all for sticking with me through this talk and, and putting up with any type of background noise that you have. Again, sincere apologies for that. Um, but 
here's my email if you have other questions. You can also, again, visit our website, coveredup.umn.edu. Uh, I want to thank all of our project partners. These are the people that gave us access to their sites to let us actually you know, tinker with this stuff. Um, and our funding is provided by uh, the the uh, ENTF uh, fund and uh, the Minnesota Invasive Terrestrial Plants and Pest Center. So thank you. I'm happy to take any questions and I'll, I'll close the window here real quick. <laughs> Thank you very much for that, Mike. We have got some great questions coming up. Uh, if you're ready to start taking those. Oh. Not sure if I'm able to hear you, Mike. I hit, I, uh, I, I sat on the button. Oh, well, that, yep. that would have done it. Yep. Right. So we've got a few questions here for you in the Q and A. Um, <laughs> we have Roxana wondering if there have been any uh, cases where removing buckthorn has introduced other invasive species. Uh, yes, absolutely. Um, and it's not, um, so the, I think perhaps the question um, pivots on on the word introduced there. Um, I wouldn't necessarily say that removing buckthorn introduced a new species um, unless it you know had seed on the on the boots of workers or in the treads of equipment or something like that, right? Um, but it has you know certainly far more commonly uh, opened the door for new invasion, right? So one of the kind of the the classic uh, examples of this is that you you remove buckthorn and then garlic mustard pops up, um, right? Garlic mustard, a very, very common uh, invasive species throughout eastern North America and uh, in forest understories. And yeah, if you remove buckthorn, garlic mustard has very easy time uh, uh, showing up, partially because it's wind dispersed. Um, so it's a it's an easy colonizer. Um, the good news is that we've actually tinkered with garlic mustard in the same way. And we see you know, some comparable effects of suppression uh, by revegetating. So you go and revegetate, it can uh, help reduce the amount of garlic mustard that shows up too. Excellent, thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, Lucy is wondering if the fall light information supports mechanical removal in the late summer and fall to have the best effect. Mm, um, so I would actually, um, I would actually think that the opposite would be true. So, um, the, so the fall light information shows that, you know, a new seedling growing is going to do the best when you give it fall light of, you know, fall light. Um, and so, and so if we're going to be removing buckthorn, perhaps, you know, don't provide the seedlings with that light in the fall. I think that's a bit of a stretch of that particular set of, of data. I, I don't know if I would um, make that argument quite yet. Um, we are investigating the timing of mechanical removal uh, in a new series of experiments. Um, so, you know, stay tuned for that. Um, hopefully, I'll be able to answer that question uh, within the next couple of years here. Excellent. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. um, have you ever tested the use of cymazine herbicide to prevent buckthorn seeds in germinating? I have not. So I don't have much to say about that. <laughs> um, that's certainly something I can put on the list, right? Honest answer, not a problem at all. Yeah. <laughs> and the next question is, in planting trees to have a more long-term and effective canopy to reduce light availability, how are they planted and maintained? Uh, most follow the urban detail with mulch wells. Is it the same or are they planted differently? Great question. So, so um, in our experiment, um, we, we were not that kind to our, our plants. Um, we, they were not, were, they were not babied in that particular way. So we didn't mulch them. We didn't water them. We didn't uh, really do anything to take care of them. Um, in, in fact, 
in later years because of the growth of um because of the growth of the elderberry species they they started to like kind of get over other plots and it was like hey you you can't you got to stay in your plot plant so we had to like kind of prune them back and stuff um and that that um so you know we were pruning them uh we were, we were actually giving them a, a worse <laughs> a worse time in that way but there is a really important caveat in that those shrubs and trees were uh, maintained inside fences they weren't always fenced because our fences failed but they were fenced areas so we didn't have to deal deal with deer um notably uh at least continually so that is a, a, a pretty big caveat that I, I should have highlighted more effectively in the talk um that's the one thing but we didn't mulch them we didn't water them anything that, that like that they were still left to their own devices other than that other than being fenced excellent Mm -hmm. uh, Michelle's asking, uh, it looks like the research has focused on heavily invaded sites with very little native understory remaining after buckthorn removal. Do you think that it's worthwhile to plant sites where there's still some native plant presence in or around the treated areas? Um, a really great question too. So, um, and so it depends, right? So if we, if we look at those lighter areas, right, uh, that where we did the seeding experience, for example, um, many of those areas did have, you know, something that showed up, right? But what showed up wasn't necessarily what was most competitive against buckthorn, right? What was there was based on the local species pool, and it's important to remember that the local species pool is, you know, in a lot of cases what ended up being invaded in the first place. So, you know, so there there is a benefit generally for doing some sort of seeding, at least in our experiments. Um, but, um, but then what naturally occurs, the, the, the volunteer species do offer some suppression. So, you know, some, something is better than nothing. Um, it's just, maybe you can augment that. Maybe you can get it to, to be a little bit more um, fine-tuned for this particular goal by planting on top of it. So it, it really, you know, we get into, you know, kind of site by site stuff at that point, but in general, I think there's still a benefit. Um, and, and we've had plenty of sites where there's plenty of volunteers, but we've changed the composition in a way that makes the community more effective at suppressing buckthorn. Excellent. Uh, Nora is asking how large were the trees and shrubs that were planted and how densely were they planted? Oh, yes. Uh, another great question. So, um, so these these trees and shrubs were um, about um, about twelve to eighteen inches tall, um, and my my conversion to centimeters is failing me on that right now. But um, you can do the math, um, and they were planted uh, twenty uh, about twenty five centimeters apart uh, on average. So very densely, not. Not something that you would really do at a large scale. You could certainly do it at small scales, like we did, right? Um, but, um, but yeah, extremely dense, um, and that's true for for the for the trees and shrubs. Uh, we had one site where we also planted ferns at a comparable dens density, um, and also the the sedge plugs were planted at the same density. So, so you can see how those all panned out. Yeah, very dense. Excellent. Uh, we have another attendee wondering how they estimate the canopy openness to help select the management practices. Great. Um, oh, and I will I will also say that um, we are basically all of our experiments since that initial um, public or that initial experiment looking at the trees and shrubs have been working on ways to relax that that planting density to, to make it more reasonable. And so um, we have experiments now looking at, you know, like five meter spacing and stuff like that um, to, to see how that pans out. So, so we're working on it. Um, <laughs> so the, the question about um, how do we estimate canopy openness? Um, there's a couple of different ways that, that we've done this. Um, you know, some of the, the more, um, more, accessible ways of doing it um, 
are in, involve an instrument called a densiometer, where you're basically looking at um, a, a curved mirror that has a has a grid etched on it, and you're looking at how many what proportion of those grids those grid cells have have canopy in them and which are open. Um, we've used hemispherical photography. Um, you can actually do this pretty easily with your your cell phone. Um, if you 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 can get a little you know a cheap little hemispherical lens for your cell phone uh, that can go over the camera there, and you can take pictures of that and then um, digitally uh, look at like the the um, number of pixels that are either you know you know green or black or blue or white and figure out openness that way and just take the proportion of of you know dark pixels to light pixels um, or like the the way that we've done this. Um, that's the most, um, like the most scientific, the most um, precise, is using um, a series of of what we call uh, quantum sensors that actually measure the amount of light that comes through. And so we go and we take a a measurement. We take two simultaneous measurements: one out in the open, um, so we have a, a sensor out in a field nearby, and we have one that we're walking around with, and we compare those instantaneous readings between the open and the you know, understory reading and the proportion of those two tell us openness. So that's the that's the way that most of those figures are are derived is through those simultaneous measurements. But there there are other ways that you can do it that you know don't require fancy equipment. Excellent. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. uh, do you know of any examples where people are not using any oh I had another mm -hmm. question entered in. Uh, are not using any biological controls, but instead entirely physically removing the buckthorn on an ongoing basis alongside replanting. Yes, um, that's ex that's 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 a very prescient question. Um, <laughs> um, so uh, actually, I'm I'm uh, starting a, a series of experiments on that this year, um, not to let the the buckthorn seed out of the robin or anything like that, but um, yeah, we're we're in, we're looking at that, and that work has been inspired by um, a, a nonprofit here in, in Minnesota called Friends of the Mississippi River, who have had some uh, success by continually removing uh, buckthorn. Basically, they go through, you know, they they cut it off, um, and you know, at like chest height or whatever, and then you know, malt for the next two years or so, they they visit it once or twice a year, um, and strip all the all the regrowth off of it. Um, and so that is a, a pretty non-disruptive way of, you know, strictly doing mechanical removal um, and and also allows for, you know, simultaneous revegetation and stuff like that. So that's that's the example that pops into my head immediately. Um, and something that, again, we're, we're looking at to try to quantify the, you know, the context dependency of that uh, effect. Um, and I think it's really interesting and something worth worth pursuing because it it does provide the opportunity for you to revegetate um, without non-targeted impacts of herbicides, without you know side effects of you know bringing like a forestry mower through or anything like that. Um, and it's an interesting line of inquiry. So we'll find out. Excellent, thank you. Mm -hmm. um, okay, Rebecca is wondering how the use of the herbicides impacts other plants, water, and the soil. Yeah, um, so that's a really broad question, and I can I can only speak to part of that. Um, I don't think I I you know, we certainly haven't measured soil and water responses. Um, generally, you know, we're applying these herbicides at rates that are below um, below the recommended amount, even so, they are often you know thought to be metabolized by soil biota and stuff like that and not, you know, cause, cause, um, larger environmental harm. Um, but, but we haven't measured that, right. As far as non-target plant species, that is something I can quantify and respond to. Um, then, uh, and so like in our, in our case study trial of, of triclopyr chlor chlorine, chlorine, choline and phosphamine ammonium, uh, we saw that, yeah, there was idiosyncrasies, uh, herbicide specific effects, where, you know, some species were more heavily harmed by each herbicide. Um, and that's, that's true. Um, you know, like phosphine ammonium does, does 
tend to you know kick uh, grasses, which is a little surprising because it's supposed to be a bud inhibitor, which should affect things that have buds like trees and shrubs, but shouldn't really affect uh, grasses. And it's not thought to really affect grasses, but it did um, probably because they're perennial, right? And they have they have these meristemic tissues that that can be affected. So there's something like something going on there. Uh, we don't know. Again, it's a really poorly understood herbicide. Um, but but um, but it does have non-target effects on on some species. And you know, at the end of the day, uh, it ended up working out when paired with revegetation. But but. Um, but if you wanted to keep those those species around, um, that would be something to consider. Excellent. Just a couple of questions left. Yeah. Um, we have uh, Cassidy is wondering if you suspect the results would be applicable to glossy buckthorn as well. Oh, thank you for asking that question. And the answer is yes. Um, so I, I mentioned that we've we've tinkered around with garlic mustard. We've also tinkered around with, with glossy buckthorn and that's um, not something that we've published yet um, or, or really disseminated, but yeah, we, we've done some, um, some trials and yeah, it seems to be uh, comparable. Excellent. Thank you. Um, the last few questions uh, that we're able to get to today seem to relate to the cost of replanting densely. Mm -hmm. um, so it's going to be kind of a bit of a two-parter here. Um, did you happen to capture the cost associated with treating these trial sites um, that would help us to determine cost on a larger stand scale? So yes. Kind of all similar. Yeah. So, um, so cost is a really nebulous thing to capture, right? Because it is dependent on the contractor and everything like that, um, amount of time and the the, pro the cost of property goals and everything like that. Um, so it it's variable, um, but. That said, you know, if we're comparing the cost of, you know, planting to seeding, um, we did estimate that, and um, planting was like a hundred times more expensive. So, um, so you know, I'm I I can't give you a, you know a dollar figure per per stem or anything like that um, off the top of my head. I think I have that somewhere, uh, but but seeding was, you know, exceptionally cheaper. Excellent. Thank you very much. Um, mm -hmm. So that does take us to the end of the Q&A for today. Uh, Mike has very generously and graciously offered to take any questions via email that we weren't able to get to. Um, so I'm just going to see if I can share my screen here for one more moment before we end. Here we go. So first and foremost, we want to thank Mike for joining us today and giving this wonderful presentation. A lot of great questions and a lot of thank yous are coming up in the chat. So thank you for that. Uh, this webinar was recorded and it will be posted on our website, www.invasivespeciescenter.ca. Just a reminder to please take a couple of minutes and fill out the short survey. We would very much appreciate it. And, and keep in mind that our next webinar will be on October 11th, 2023 to 11 a.m. Uh, featuring Ali Abram from the city of Mississauga, discussing uh, the municipal case study, developing and implementing an invasive species management plan. So again, thank you very much, Mike. We very much appreciate your time. It was a wonderful talk and uh, very, very informative.